Okay, so all those previous videos were, you know, normal physiology. So how, do, how does muscle contraction work? And not whenever you learn normal physiology, you could take it a step further and, and talk about, well, what might affect that normal physiology. And one of the things that affects muscle contraction is death. All right, so when an animal dies, all right, the muscles become uh, stiff, right? They, they lock up in a contracted state, and that's called rigor mortis. So rigor mortis is the stiffening of muscles a few hours after death due to the lack of ATP. Now, this is always a little tricky to think about, right? Because ATP causes contraction, but why does the lack of ATP cause the muscle to stiffen or basically stay contracted? And the reason is, there's a few reasons, but one is that ATP is actually required to detach the myosin from the actin, all right? So when ATP is no longer being produced, right, you don't have the ATP to detach myosin and actin. So you don't have the ATP to cause relaxation. All right, so let's look at a few of the ATP-dependent events. So the first one is ATP is required for detachment of the myosin heads. All right, obviously if there's no ATP, those cross bridges are all locked together. All right, so they're stuck. Second thing, ATP is needed to transport calcium back into storage. So now you got the calcium staying, right? So the calcium stays attached to troponin. The myosin is locked together with the actin, and that muscle is stiff. All right. Um, calcium also leaks into the sarcoplasm, so that's going to just add more calcium, um, calcium uh, to the troponin and cause the cross bridges. So muscles are going to be stiff until they start to deteriorate. So eventually, right, as a few hours go by, the rigor mortis actually goes away. And that's because the muscle deteriorates, the cross bridges break, and the muscles become relaxed again. So they can use rigor mortis to help determine time of death. Um, if the, the, the body's still in a state of rigor, then that death happened fairly recently. All right. All right, so that's rigor mortis. Uh, some other things. So the next two slides I find really interesting. Again, it's when you learn the normal function and then you can apply it to other things like, like medications that might be used or uh, toxins that are out there that might affect the normal physiology. So the first thing we're going to talk about is botulinum toxin. So this is a toxin that's produced by a bacterium. All right, the bacterium's name is Clostridium botulinum. All right, this bacteria lives in soil. Um, it's an anaerobic bacteria, meaning it doesn't like oxygen. So it's found in areas where there's very little oxygen. So like deep down in soil. Um, well, it produces a toxin. And this toxin is a neurotoxin. But look at how it works. So the mechanism by how this toxin works is it blocks the release or the exocytosis of acetylcholine. It actually kind of cleaves or breaks a protein that's required for that exocytosis. So here is that neuromuscular junction. Botulinum toxin blocks this step. All right, It blocks that exocytosis. So then you ask yourself, well, what would happen then? Well, if you have enough of this toxin and it blocks these neuromuscular junctions, well, then this muscle is not going to be stimulated. So this muscle stays relaxed. All right. Now, this bacteria could be consumed. All right. And it can cause what's called botulism. So botulism is a form of paralysis because muscles can't contract. Um, and it can cause death, especially when it uh, affects respiratory muscles, right? You have to be able to contract your diaphragm. Every time you breathe, your diaphragm contracts. But if you can't stimulate your diaphragm, then you can't breathe. 
Um, now, when did, when did people get botulism? Well, it happened often when canned goods got the bacteria in there. So if we weren't properly canning and killing bacteria before we put the food in a can, this bacteria loves being in canned goods because there's very little oxygen in there. So the bacteria, let's say they're canning some sort of vegetable. Well, the vegetable's grown, you know, in soil. So if you don't wash those vegetables, if you don't, you know, quote-unquote sterilize those vegetables before you put them in the can or while they're in the can, this bacteria could grow and start to produce this toxin, all right? And people could get botulism from that. Uh, it was also often called the sausage poison. A couple theories there. One, the bacteria actually kind of looks like a sausage. It's kind of a rod-shaped bacteria. Uh, but people were also getting uh, botulism from improperly produced sausage. All right. Now, we kind of figured it out, right? And we learned how to better can goods and how to properly produce foods so you don't really see botulism anymore but someone had an idea to utilize the toxin all right they identified the toxin in the bacteria they found that actually it's one of the most toxic substances in nature and they said hey we could use this we could use this to cause muscle relaxation all right so it's basically a muscle relaxer um, and they kind of market it as botox well, Botox stands for botulinum toxin, and you can eject it into muscles, all right, either for cosmetic reasons or for other medical reasons. Um, any situation where the, the problem is over contraction of muscle or muscle spasms, you can actually use Botox. Um, now, as far as cosmetics go, the reason why it makes wrinkles kind of go away is that when muscles are relaxed, they're thicker. All right, When facial muscles are contracted, they're thinner. So you can relax the facial muscles, and it kind of fills in the wrinkles All right, because the muscle, when it relaxes, gets a little bigger and thicker. So you can treat wrinkles, migraines, or tension headaches that could be due to muscle contraction, uh, you can kind of treat when the eyes are not aligned properly. You could relax the muscles that move the eyes. Uncontrollable blinking can be treated. Vocal cords that spasm due to muscle. Back spasms can be treated with Botox. And then another interesting one is sweating. Now, sweating isn't muscle. It's sweat glands. But it's the same type of neuron. All right? It releases acetylcholine. So it's the same situation but instead of a muscle here, it's a sweat gland. So you can actually block the nerve or nerves that stimulate sweat glands. All right. So learning the neuromuscular junction now allows you to understand how Botox works. There are other things out there that don't block the exocytosis. They actually block the receptor. All right. And when we have something that blocks a receptor... We call it an antagonist. Antagonists block things. Agonists mimic things. All right, but these are acetylcholine receptor antagonists. So they block the receptor. If you block that receptor, you can't stimulate the muscle. So it's kind of the same result. It causes muscle relaxation. Uh, one of them was found in plants. So South American Indians used to put these, this plant extract called curare on their darts, and they would use that to kill animals, maybe even protect themselves from other, you know, maybe competitors. Um, but they could kill a lot of animals using these um, darts um, that contained acetylcholine receptor antagonists. Uh, there's also medications that we use that do this. One's called atropine. So it's the same thing as curare. It's an acetylcholine receptor antagonist used to relax muscle. So we could use it to dilate pupils. So if you've ever had your eyes you know, looked at and they put those little drops in and your pupils dilate, well, that medication is an acetylcholine receptor antagonist. 
and it causes your iris to not be stimulated by the neuron. So when the iris isn't stimulated, the little muscle relaxes and your pupils dilate. We can use a similar drug to increase the heart rate. Um, this we haven't really gotten into our heart, but acetylcholine slows your heart rate. So there's a nerve that slows your heart rate. So right now your heart rate's probably pretty slow because you're probably resting now and maybe even falling asleep during these lectures. But to slow your heart rate requires a nerve called the vagus nerve. We'll talk about it towards the end of the semester. But that vagus nerve uses acetylcholine to slow the heart. Well, if you block it, the heart will speed up. All right, so it's using an acetylcholine receptor antagonist to speed up the heart. And then there's other ones used during anesthesia. Uh, we use muscle relaxers during anesthesia, and they all somehow block this neuromuscular junction in order to relax the muscle. All right? So these things all cause muscle relaxation. These, this thing causes muscle contraction. So these are really interesting. These are anticholinesterase agents. So they aren't blocking the receptor. They're not blocking the uh, exocytosis. They're blocking the enzyme that gets rid of acetylcholine. So if you slow the enzyme, you'll actually have more acetylcholine. So the acetylcholine levels will stay high and keep causing contraction. So these can actually cause contraction. So if you've got a, something that does the opposite of something else, they're antidotes for one another. So if you're ever in South America and get shot with one of those poison darts, you could theoretically use one of these as an antidote. All right? Because it'll uh, reverse the effect of the receptor blockers. All right? So that's kind of interesting. There's also a medication called neostigmine. So it's really important medication for people with myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis, uh, we're not going to get into details, but it causes muscles to become very weak. And the most important muscle is that diaphragm again. Uh, with severe myasthenia gravis, some patients have trouble breathing because of the very weak muscle contractions. So this drug can strengthen the muscle contraction by keeping that acetylcholine level up. All right, so that's a really good use of these anticholinesterase agents. Others can be used dangerously. They could be weapons. So we've probably heard of nerve gas or sarin gas. Um, these are gases that are anti- are anticholinesterases. So sarin gas uh, can be, ca has been used as a weapon, a kind of a weapon of mass destruction. Um, there are also pesticides. So we can even use these things to kill um, pests. Um, so what they do, again, is they cause muscle contraction and that, that can kill someone. Because just as important as contracting the diaphragm is relaxing the diaphragm. So if you cause the diaphragm to stay contracted, you're, you're not going to be able to breathe. you got to be able to contract and relax. Contract and relax. All right? So again, that diaphragm is um, one of the most important skeletal muscles because it's required for you to breathe. A lot of the other muscles you can live without. Yeah, you might be paralyzed, right, or not be able to move, but without the diaphragm, you can't breathe. All right, then the next couple things, we've got a virus. So polio, you've probably heard of polio. We don't really see polio anymore because of the vaccines. All right, if we, if we didn't believe in vaccines and stopped using the polio virus vaccines, it would come right back, and you would see children paralyzed uh, wherever you go. Um, back in the early 1900s, kids were paralyzed quite often due to polio. Uh, polio is a virus that destroys the motor neurons. So it basically kills these neurons. And if you kill off a bunch of motor neurons, muscles become weak and atrophy, or you can become 
paralyzed. So polio, there's a there's a wide range. Some people have just weak muscles. Some are you know completely paralyzed. Uh, but again, thanks to vaccinations, uh, we don't have all these children paralyzed. And then the last one I want to talk about is tetanus. You've probably heard of tetanus. You've probably had a tetanus vaccine. Well, that's to protect you from another bacterium called Clostridium tetani, or tetany. That's another one of these anaerobic bacteria. It's a lot like the cause of botulism, but the toxin does the complete opposite. Whereas the botulinum toxin caused relaxation, this toxin causes muscle spasms. All right? So it causes over-contraction of muscles. And it often starts with muscles of the, of the jaw, so you get locked jaw, and it could progress throughout the body. But again, luckily we don't see this because we have vaccines. Now, if you haven't had a tetanus shot and you get a deep, dirty wound, you could actually get this bacteria in that wound and you can develop these um, symptoms of tetanus. Um, so usually if you get a cut, you're going to get stitches, they're going to ask you, uh, when did you have your tet last tetanus shot? And if, it, it's, if it's been longer than, say, 10 years, they're probably going to give you that shot. But again, you could choose not to, but you could get lockjaw and, and paralysis. All right, so again, I think it's cool to learn the normal physiology, and then now you can apply it to all these things um, that are out there that might affect that neuromuscular junction. All right, I think we will go through this one quickly. Um, I'm not going to read this slide. This is just a bunch of text, but you should notice that we've learned about most of these proteins. Myosin, actin, tropomyosin, troponin. We have some other structural proteins. We've talked about alpha actinin and myomycin. We haven't really talked about titan. Uh, this is a big protein. Uh, it's a structural protein um, of the sarcomere. Um, it actually kind of acts like a spring. All right. So it gives that muscle the elasticity and extensibility. All right. Because it acts kind of like a spring. Um, nebulin, I'm not going to talk about, but dystrophin should look familiar. That word, you might have heard of muscular dystrophy. Well, muscular dystrophy is a genetic defect in this protein called dystrophin. Uh, basically, this protein is used to attach the muscle cells to the connective tissue. All right, so it holds those muscle cells to the connective tissue uh, of the tendons. So if it's defective, the muscle can actually separate from the tendons. All right and that can cause uh, the, this muscular problem. All right, so this is just a summary of, of proteins that are very important for muscle contraction. Uh, we'll end that video, and then the last video, we're going to go over a few other things, like ATP production. Um, we're going to look at different types of muscle contraction, di different types of muscle cells. Uh, so I promise this next video will be the last one uh, for chapter 9.